Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, March the 6th, 2021. It is currently 1032 a.m. Central Time, and I'm here at Victory Baptist Church. You know where I'm sitting. I'm here in the back of the sanctuary. I have my podcast equipment all set up. I have bottles of water, Bible dictionary, commentaries, notebooks, pencils, a Bible, and I have queued up here in my software another sermon on the Sermon on the Mount coming to us from a church in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Now, if you haven't been a part of this series, shame, 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 shame on you because you should be listening to all of my series that I'm never going to finish because I always engage in these series that seem to take forever. But I, hopefully we can finish this one, okay? Um, hopefully today my goal is to work on um, the Christian in Complete Armor and The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. Um, There's so many other things I need to get to. But yes, but right now we're going to focus on this. We're going to focus on the Sermon on the Mount. Guys there, I had to sneeze, okay? I had to sneeze. Yeah, no, I'm not sick. I just had to sneeze. I don't, something, something got to me. I had to sneeze. Thank, thank goodness for the mute button, right? Are, are we, are we not thankful for mute buttons on microphones? I am very grateful for them. Okay. So, uh, so here's what we've, here's what we've done. And let me try to just get everyone on the same page. Um, I never know when someone jumps into the middle of one of these series and they have no idea what's going on and versus the people who listen all the time who are tired of the review. It's, it's kind of like, how do I balance this out? So I'm just going to try to make this short and sweet. And if you've missed everything, go back and listen. Here's, here's what we're doing. My friends in Nebraska who attend a church in Council Bluffs, Iowa, which is, well, if you know where Omaha is, you know where Council Bluffs, Iowa is. They're right next to each other, okay? So they go to a church in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and they told me, hey, our pastor's getting ready to do a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And I was like, oh, that's interesting because there's like nine... 12, 14 different ways that people have interpreted the Sermon on the Mount throughout church history. Do you know which way he's going to interpret it? No, we don't know. Okay, well, well, I'll listen, you'll listen, and we'll we'll talk about it. And I thought, well, well, you know, this is what I'll do. I'll just take those sermons. We'll play them right here live on the air on the Theology Central podcast, and we will discuss them, and we will work through his method of interpretation. I'll author my method of interpretation, and everyone will benefit. And the goal is by the time we're done, everyone's going to know the Sermon on the Mount better than they did when they started, and that's what we have attempted to do. So far, the pastor in Council Bluffs, Iowa, I'm not naming him or his church because this is nothing about a personal attack. This is nothing about trying to offer some personal criticism. This is simply about using his sermons to get us into this deeper discussion. So far, he's offered a very traditional interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount that is probably common in the church you attend and probably is common in in the way you've probably handled the text throughout your Christian life as well. And it's a method of interpretation that I greatly question, I greatly challenge, and to be honest, I just completely reject. The way he interprets it is this. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus Christ offering basically the ethics of the kingdom. How do you get into the kingdom? By repentance. How do you know your repentance is genuine and that you're genuinely going to be a part of the kingdom of God in the future and that you're currently a part of the spiritual kingdom? Well, how do you know that repentance is genuine? You look at your life and you measure it by the ethics laid down in the Sermon on the Mount. So in other words, if you live according to the Sermon on the Mount, your repentance is genuine. If you do not, your repentance is not genuine. Therefore, you are not saved. So basically, the Sermon on the Mount is a test to test to see if your salvation is genuine. Now, he doesn't really, he he spends no time trying to in any way, shape, or form offer up any meaningful way in order, in a meaningful way in how we should administer that test, how we grade that test, how we judge that test, because he said a lot of contradictory things. On one hand, he's made it very clear that no one's going to follow it perfectly. So we have a a perfect test to judge our imperfect adherence to that test, yet we can be assured that we are saved or that we pass the test. It's really, here's this perfect test and it's going to test our imperfection and an imperfect score is sufficient to know that my salvation is, well, Okay, it, it, he, he doesn't even try to explain this in any way, shape, or form or even or, or lay out 
any method in the way this is done. But every, nobody in the church seems to mind. Everyone just seems to say amen, and everyone seems to be okay with it. I would be horrified because if, if this, I will say it again, if the Sermon on the Mount is the thing to test the genuineness of my salvation, then I'm lost. And so are you. And so is everyone you know. So is every preacher you've ever known because no one fulfills the Sermon on the Mount perfectly. So if it's the test, then we're all imperfect. And if we break, if we're guilty of one point of the law, we're guilty of all of it. So we would all be lost. So that just makes no sense to me. So he, so he says that it's a test. No one's going to do it perfectly. But at the same time, he has now implied at least five times, maybe seven times, that because you are a Christian, Jesus Christ has come to make it possible, giving you the power so that you can obey it. Yet at the same time, he says, no one's going to do it perfectly. That's even more confusion, right? I can do it, but you can't do it. Well, well, then if Jesus came to make it possible, then why can no one do it? Well, because you don't want to. Well, if I don't want to, why isn't Jesus power? Why isn't Jesus powerful enough to change my want to? to a want to, or I don't want to, to a want to. Why can't he fix that, right? And then everyone would keep it perfectly. So it's this really weird, like, the more I listen, the more convoluted it becomes. And trying to unpack it, I I really have reached a point of just great frustration because he's basically turned the, this is basically what's happened. His sermon on the Sermon on the Mount, his sermons on the Sermon on the Mount has basically rendered the Sermon on the Mount meaningless, useless. It's just like he's, it's just like being on a hamster wheel, just running around in circles, not going anywhere, and no one's going to do anything with it. Hey, it's a test, but you're not going to do it perfectly. Okay, well then I'm good to go because I don't do it perfectly. Hey, you have the power to do it. Okay, I have the power, but don't, but if I don't do it, it's okay because no one's going to do it perfectly. It's like, so basically people are going to go, well, there's the Sermon on the Mount. Don't really need to worry about it. If It's a test, but it's not really a test, and I can do it perfectly, but I'm not going to do it perfectly. So really it just becomes, I don't know what, it's just there. So that's where we are, and now we pick up the sermon that was preached last Sunday at Council Bluffs, Iowa on the Sermon on the Mount, right? We are, I think, according to this, the text for the sermon we're about to listen to is Matthew chapter 5. Let me give me a second. I'm in 2 Corinthians because I was doing a devotional. Um, but uh, let me move to uh, Matthew chapter 5. Let's go to verse 21. 21 to 26 is where we are. Matthew 5, 21 through 26. I'm not going to read it because obviously he's going to read it. So Matthew 5, 21 through 26. Are you ready? If you have a Bible, open it up to Matthew 5, 21 through 26. Grab a notebook. Let's spend this Saturday morning doing a little bit of study here. Are you ready? A little bit of study. Let's see what he has to say in regards to this text. Let's see if he's consistent with the hermeneutic he's already established. Let's see if he does more, adds more confusion. Let's just see. Are you ready? Council Bluffs, Iowa, last Sunday, Matthew 5, 21 through 26. Here we go. All right. If you have any, if you're listening to me live, feel, feel free, any comment, any question you have, feel free. I don't care if it interrupts everything because, look, I'm, I'm spending all of these hours reviewing these sermons. At this point, I'll just be honest with you. At this point, I'm already kind of ready to just give up, okay? But I don't want to give up because I want to finish it. But I definitely, I definitely don't want to give up. If, if people are out there going, hey, okay, this is really challenging me to rethink the Sermon on the Mount, okay, keep going. Well, then I definitely don't want to give up. But if there's anything I can do to help you in regards to this, by all means, please throw in your questions, your confusion. Um, but, hey, you may just be as confused as I am, but hopefully you'll look at that confusion and go, wait a minute, I've done some of the same things with the Sermon on the Mount. Now I don't even know what to do. All right, great. That's where I want you to be. You say, well, what's the answer? I want you to first feel that, that confusion of, I, I don't know what to do with the Sermon on the Mount. Great. Feel that, and then we'll try to figure out some solutions. I think I've already offered you some solutions, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to, we'll, when we get to the end of this, we'll see. Are you ready? Here we go. That's nine minutes of introduction and review. I apologize. Here we go. Uh, we're not going to finish this. There's no way. This guy preaches as long as I do. He preaches about an hour. I usually preach an hour, so... There's no way we doing a review of an hour long sermon literally can take three hours. So we're just going to we're just going to go until I feel like we're ready to stop. All right, here we go. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew this morning.
Matthew chapter 5, and we want to look at verses 21 through 26. Anger, murder, and reconciliation. Well, uh, which one of these do you identify with? (laughs) Yeah, I'm afraid so. I'm afraid we probably all identify with all of them on one level or another, sadly. But uh, let's uh, ask the Lord to bless. Lord, we thank you for your word now and pray that you would minister to our hearts as we study together. Help me to teach it accurately and clearly. Uh, Thank you for this uh, in-depth teaching from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, on how we should then live as those who are ultimately going to be uh, citizens in the kingdom. And we look forward to the kingdom to come. But even now, I think uh, we as your people are to give a little taste of the kingdom in terms of how we live our lives. And so, Lord, uh, encourage us, strengthen us, uh, convict us, uh, reprove us, whatever we need as we work our way through the text here. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, we are in Matthew, and the theme is Christ the King. And we are in this section right here in chapters 5 through 7, the pronouncements of the king proving his judicial right to the throne as seen in the wisdom of his kingdom teaching. And uh, as we are studying Matthew, we uh, note that Matthew presents uh, Jesus as the messianic king. That's, as I say, the theme. And prophetically, history could be summarized in this way, I think. The king is coming. The king has come. The king is coming. Right? That's true. Uh, As we consider the Old Testament, the king is coming. The prophets uh, are saying this constantly. He's to be presented. He's coming. The king has come. Alas, he was rejected. Came into his own and his own received him not. What's the message now? Well, the king is still coming. There's There's a second coming. And this time he's coming to rule. So this is really prophetic history in a nutshell right there. A couple of more slides as far as the flow of thought that we have represented here in Matthew 4 and 5. You know, he uses slides, PowerPoint slides, which you know how I feel about PowerPoint slides. I believe they're the work of the enemy. I believe they're of Satan. That's hyperbolic. I'm joking. I just hate PowerPoint slides because of all of the torture. I had to sit through military briefings with PowerPoint slides and someone just stand there reading the slides. And I would be like, just send me the slides. I could have already been done reading these, but okay. That's, that's neither here nor there. I just want you to understand when you're like, okay, what is he referring to? He's referring to slides. I just, I do find it fascinating that he began, as he begins these sermons, as he's moved into Matthew five, he doesn't start the sermon by reminding everyone of the hermeneutic. Like the hermeneutic guys, hey, remember, as we get into this section, this is testing to see if your repentance is genuine. He's not starting that way. It's just really weird. He established a hermeneutic that he really has not stayed consistent with. If I was preaching this and that was my hermeneutic, every sermon would be like, guys, are you ready this morning for another test? We're going to test again to see if the repentance of everyone in this church is genuine I hope you pass the test this morning, but if you do not, today would be the day to call out to God and to repent and to turn from your sin so that you will be in the future kingdom. Because if your repentance is not genuine, you are going to die and go to hell. You think that would be the thing he would emphasize, but he doesn't. So he established a hermeneutic that seems to now be irrelevant to his march through the rest of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That is what I'm finding fascinating. Just from a preacher's perspective, if I establish that as the hermeneutic, trust me, I'd be driving that home at the beginning at, at the beginning of every sermon. It's time for a test again. Are you ready? Are you ready for a test? How did you do last week? How did you do? La- All right. Well, maybe you passed last week, but this te- this week we may find out that your repentance is not genuine because every section would be another test. And how many sections can you fail before your repentance is no longer genuine? It's, you may think I'm being absurd, but I'm not. That's the hermeneutic he established. That's the hermeneutic he must live by. He, if, look, you live and die by the hermeneutic you establish. That's the hermeneutic he established. I don't understand why he would not be just 
driving that point home. It's like it's a test, but no one's really taking the test seriously. It's like it's that kind of test where the teacher gives you the test, but you know that he's just doing it to scare you and that he's really not going to accept the grades. He just got tired of everyone coming in, not really paying attention. So now he's like, here's a test and this is going to – and then you take the test and then at the end he they, – they, throw them in the trash and say, I just wanted to make sure you guys realize that, hey, we're not messing around here. Like I've seen that happen in college and I think even in high school. It's almost like, hey, here's this serious test to determine if your salvation is serious, if your salvation is genuine. But, you know, I mean, come on, not, not really, not really. So let's just move on and focus on other things. That, that's kind of, that's what it feels like. And I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just trying to be honest with you. If you establish your hermeneutic, you've got to be consistent with said hermeneutic throughout the rest of the section. Now, I've probably, I've been guilty of this. Every preacher has been guilty of this because sometimes you're like, you know, that's what I really want to emphasize. And then two weeks later, you don't even really want to emphasize that anymore. You want to emphasize something else. Well, okay. I understand. I understand that we all can be guilty of it, but it doesn't make it right when any of us does this. All right, let's continue. I've... Uh, repentance necessary to enter the kingdom repent the kingdom's at hand then we have the beatitudes uh, descriptive of of kingdom citizens who have repented and salt and light the disciples influence and testimony in the world and then we saw last week that Christ fulfills the law and the prophets makes kingdom living possible And with that, I want you to make this connection. I think you got it last week, but just to review, uh, Christ says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. It has different layers. We unpacked them last week. But I think that certainly means in terms of fulfilling, Christ came that the deeper essence of the law, the spiritual intention of the law might be fulfilled in his people. And we see that as we come to the end of that first section in in, uh, Matthew 5.20 there, where he says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness, that's the issue here, practical righteousness, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So the point... Did you catch it? Now, if you were sitting here with me right now, I would stop. And I would wait until you could identify what you should have just caught right there. I, I, should, I should just sit here and wait to, if anyone's listening to me live. Yesterday, I didn't think, I, well, I thought one person was listening to me live and I got the final statistics last night. We had like, I don't know, there was like 57 people listening live. I don't even know what it was. And I was like, whoa, uh, it's just weird. Like you can have all these pe- people listening to you live and they, never, they don't ever say a word. But this is a situation where I almost want to wait. I don't, I don't currently know how many people are listening to me live, but I almost want to sit here and wait and go, did you catch, did you catch it? Did you catch it? And, and, and wait and see if people can identify what they should have caught. If you did not catch it, let me, uh, let me help you. He said, practical righteousness. Practical righteousness. You have to have a practical righteousness that reaches a certain level for for your righteousness, for you to enter into the kingdom of God. If you do not have a certain level of practical righteousness, you don't get into heaven. That, as a non-Catholic, that should make you go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, So now my salvation is based on the level of practical righteousness I exhibit in my life? So my salvation is determined by the practical righteousness I display. What happened to the imputed righteousness of Christ? If my salvation is based off the imputed righteousness of Christ, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, then I'm saved. That's what I'm saved by, not by my practical righteousness. So he is reading this. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's saying that that has to be your practical righteousness must exceed the practical righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees or you don't get into heaven. I think Jesus is saying, yes, your righteousness must exceed that of the, of the, of the Pharisees and the scribes. And it's got to be an imputed righteousness. They had an external righteousness. You have to have a righteousness that goes far beyond that. And the only way that's going to work is an imputed righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. 
That's the righteousness you need. He just made it about your practical righteousness. He literally is turning the entire Protestant Reformation upside down, throwing out the Protestant Reformation. This this church in Council Bluffs, Iowa, needs to change its name to the Catholic, uh, Catholic Church. They just threw out, literally, this is turning the entire Protestant Reformation upside down. I'm going to back that up just a little bit so that you can hear this, okay? All right, this may be as far as we get today. This may be, whoa, I was not expecting this. I was not expecting this. Wow, this, (laughs) okay, here we go. Let's back this up. Let's back this up. I think I've they can, I think I've backed it up far enough. Let's see if we, if you can catch it this time. Listen carefully. The key word is practical righteousness. Practical righteousness versus an imputed righteousness. Or think of it practical righteousness versus positional righteousness. My standing before God positionally is because of an imputed righteousness which is accredited in my account. It doesn't make me righteous. It's not an infused righteousness. It's a legal declaration that I am legally declared perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, perfectly obedient, or perfectly without sin because of the per- passive and active obedience of Christ being accredited to my account. Read the Westminster Confession. Read the London Baptist, London Baptist Confession of Faith. Read any of the reformers. This is basic Protestant theology, okay? This, what we're hearing here, this is something other than that, all right? Now, listen. Now, I know. Listen. I keep saying listen, 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 listen. I keep repeating myself because I want you to get this. Look, I have no, look, if I was to talk to this pastor, I am sure that he would say he completely agrees with the the Protestant Reformation view on justification by grace alone, through faith alone, because of an imputed righteousness. He would He would defend all of that theologically. The problem is he is setting up a teaching dealing with the Sermon on the Mount that violates that theological perspective. In other words, in his hermeneutic, he's violating, his hermeneutic is violating the theology he would profess to believe. Now we've probably all done that, but that's what is happening here. Listen carefully to this again. To review, Uh, Christ says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That has different layers. We unpacked them last week. But I think that certainly means, in terms of fulfilling, Christ came that the deeper essence of the law, the spiritual intention of the law, might be fulfilled in his people. And we see that as we come to the end of that first section in in, uh, Matthew 5.20 there, where he says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness... That's the issue here. Practical righteousness. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So the point is, kingdom people are defined by true repentance and internal reality, which then demonstrates itself in righteousness. In this case, practical righteousness uh, and external reality. Now, the remainder of the sermon... Practical righteousness. That's what must be present or you don't get into heaven. So your your future, your you getting into heaven is determined by the level of practical righteousness which you display in your life. And without it, you don't get into heaven. So then, then why do we say that Jesus paid it all? Why do we say Jesus finished it? Why do we say that my... So guess what? Based on the theology he just established, you cannot have any assurance of salvation. You can have zero. Because even if you have a certain level of practical righteousness today, you may not maintain that level of practical righteousness tomorrow. So the only way you got to know, you got to get to the end of your life, and then you got to look back at the end of your life and realize, then, then, then ask yourself, as, as the totality of my Christian Christian life, did I maintain a certain level of practical righteousness that is sufficient to get me into heaven? And what level of practical righteousness is sufficient to get it, get you into heaven? How much? Because again, if you violate one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. So when you get to the end of the life of your life, if you're honest with yourself, guess what you're going to have to declare? I am guilty of all the law because I kept breaking one point of the law. So I'm guilty of it over and over and over and over again. I, I violated God's law and what I did and what I did not do. I violated God's law in action and in thought. I violated God's uh, law over and over and over and over again. So what practical level of righteousness would ever be sufficient to prove the genuineness of one's repentance? 
My salvation is either based on the finished work of Jesus Christ or it's based off the continuing work of me. And I will argue making it based off the, this, this is Catholicism. Catholicism teaches that you received an infused righteousness at salvation. God's righteousness was infused inside of you. And now you, you maintain that salvation by your cooperation with that righteousness and living it out. No, we, justification is not about an infused righteousness. It's not infused, it's imputed. This, this is staggering to me. This, this, is, this is coming from a supposed non-Catholic church. Let me, I, I don't have my London Baptist Confession near me. Let me see here. I do have the Westminster. So let me, I'm going to just go to the Westminster. I've had it open because we, we need to deal with the section on uh, submission to the civil mag- magistrates, but we won't get to that right now. Let me go here, All right? There's the Nicene Creed. Okay, here's the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, six, Seven, let's see, there's eight. Here, here we go. The chapter on justification. Arrest Westminster Confession of Faith, all right? Listen carefully. Here's the Westminster Confession of Faith teaching the Reformed Protestant doctrine of justification. Now, this church I think that we're listening to is not very, refo- clearly not very Reformed. Clearly, uh, I'm having a hard time even calling them Protestant I, I, I'm about to just refer to them as, they're more Catholic than many Catholics I know, okay? All right, here we go. And this is, and I'm saying that as someone who uh, attended a Catholic university working on a degree in Catholic theology, all right? So, so I'm saying that as someone who has pretty good understanding of Catholicism. And so I, 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 think, I, I think I'm being correct in saying that. Here we go. Let's listen to uh, their, this chapter in the Westminster Confession of Faith on Justification. Listen carefully. Paragraph one. Those whom God effectually calleth, he also freely justifieth, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, nor by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ unto them, they they receiving and resting on him in his righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves, it is the gift of God. So they go so far to say, look, the faith that I have, that's not even mine. God grants me that faith. He grants me that repentance and he accounts to me the perfect righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. That is how I get into heaven. Not, oh, you get into heaven because you have a certain level of practical righteousness. That is insane. That is literally teaching an infused righteousness, which is straight up Catholicism. And yet you talk to the people in that church. Do you agree with Catholicism? No, Catholicism is a cult. Catholicism is a false religion. Catholicism is ancient Babylonian religion. It's pagan. It's ungodly. How dare the Pope is, is and they, they would criticize Catholicism all day in that church, all day. And they just are getting a sermon straight up on the Catholic view of justification, basically. Well, I, I am just dumbfounded by this. So now my justification is literally determined by a level of practical righteousness. And he would try to back, if he was confronted with this, he would backtrack it all day. But you can backtrack it all day. The problem is his hermeneutic has set him up for this because this is all a test to determine if one's saved by the practical righteousness one displays in their, in their life. Definite, de- and the conclusion, you'll never know you're saved until you get to the end of your life, and hopefully you have enough practical righteousness. But he's not going to tell us what level of practical righteousness I must demonstrate in order to be saved. He's not going to tell me that. Well, if the Sermon on the Mount is the test, th- then the only way to test my practical righteousness is based on how close I get to the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get very close. Go back to the Beatitudes. Are you pure in heart? Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? You're probably condemned already. Wow, this, 
this is frightening. This is literally frightening. I, 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 I so someone call Luther, call Martin Luther, not, Mar- not, not, not Martin Luther Jr. King, J- not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther, the reformer, the Protestant reformer. Someone call him and tell him that, hey, that whole Protestant Reformation thing, it, it, it's a failure. It failed. It's over. Catholicism ultimately wins out in the end. You know why Catholicism ultimately wins out in the end? It's because we all want to feel like that we do something in order to get our salvation. People say, no, you don't. Well, according to this, if I don't have enough practical righteousness in my life, I'm not saved. So what am I looking for to determine if I'm saved? Not that, and I'm sitting here in the back of the church looking at the front. On the front of my pulpit, there's a a cross. And right behind my pulpit, there's a cross on the wall. I'm not looking to that cross anymore. Guess what I'm looking to? My life, looking to my life. And don't you see, that's what happens in the Protestant world over. That's why we think we're so much better than everyone else. That thinks, that's why we think we're so much right, more righteous than everyone else. That's why we sometimes are so condemning of everyone because we think that we're so good. But you're living in a land of denial. Yeah, this is, this just makes me just want to just give up. We should just all go back to the Catholic Church. We should just all go back to Catholicism. I, I, I'm starting to think the only re- reason some Protestants aren't Catholics is because they just don't like being told what to do by the Pope. But they just want to be their own Pope. But they don't have a problem, I guess, with completely denying the doctrine of justification as taught throughout, I don't know, since the Reformation. We, we could go, I mean, we can get to a whole historical argument. We, we won't get into that. All right, here we go. Let's Let's... Well, we didn't get very far. I almost want to just stop right there because I think I'm really driving home a point that we all need to really consider, but we'll go a little bit further. We'll go a little bit further. Here we go. On the Mount in chapters 5 through 7, Matthew 5 through 7, is essentially a further unpacking, if you will, of the truth of Matthew 5.20. So it's pretty important that we nail this down. Everything builds on the righteousness Christ came to fulfill in the lives of his people as seen in 5.20. The theme of the remainder of the sermon, in essence, answers the question, how shall we then live as kingdom people? As those who are kingdom citizens headed for the kingdom, how should we then live? As believers living in the church age, we note the prominent New Testament emphasis is on the Spirit, who now lives inside of us. We are the temple of the living God. And we note that the fruit of the Spirit is really a kingdom emphasis, if you will. Because the new covenant and the kingdom go together. Really, the fruit of the Spirit could in a sense be called the fruit of the kingdom. Kingdom living is spirit-filled living based on our new covenant relationship with God through Christ. So although we're not in the kingdom as yet, we have a little taste of it in the sense of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Flexed by, he keeps saying, we're not in the kingdom yet. We're not, are we not in the spiritual kingdom? Are we not in the spiritual kingdom by salvation? Are we not translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Are are we not? I'm I'm just perplexed by what is he keep, he has to be referring to the, the, the future reign. Um, I okay. Give me a second here. I know it's in Colossians. I just got to look it up where where it is. I, I'm just baffled by that language. He, he's used it in a couple of sermons. Okay, hang on. Okay, from the there we go. All right, it is Col- it's Colossians one. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I'm going to mark Matthew. Go to Colossians one. Let me mark this. Colossians one. Okay. Colossians 1, Colossians 1, uh, let's see here, yeah, uh, is it Colossians 1? I thought it was Colossians 1, let's see here, let me read, uh, oh, I'm in Colossians 2, that's the problem. Yeah, Colossians 1, here we go, Colossians 1. When you're reading Colossians 2.13 and it doesn't make any sense, Check yourself. I need to go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay, Colossians 1, 13. He's writing to the church at Colossae, right? 
and they and he tells them they've now been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. If they've been translated into it, then we're in the kingdom now. There is a, we are in the spiritual kingdom now. We are citizens of the spiritual kingdom now. So we were in the kingdom of God. And then we can say that there is a future visible manifestation of that kingdom during the millennial reign. If you believe in a literal millennial reign, I don't understand why he keeps saying we're not in the kingdom. I I don't, I'm really perplexed by that. I'm really perplexed by that, but okay. Maybe that's what he means. It's just, maybe he's not articulating it that way. I'm I'm just a little baffled by that, but I'm more baffled by what he's now done to the doctrine of justification. Uh, That's, yes, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. Um, uh, In fact, we have someone, we have someone currently listening. We have someone currently listening who is, uh, who attends this church that we are currently reviewing because I'm still greatly perplexed by what has happened here. Okay. But uh, so I don't, I don't get, again, the not being in the kingdom is not um, is not that troubling to me. I'm confused by it, but I'm not troubled by it. What he just did in Matthew 5 by talking about a practical righteousness is what determines to me is is straight up Catholicism, and that's where my uh, confusion is. But we'll we'll continue on and see uh, where else we go. I don't know how far we're going to go because I think. By going back to the Westminster Confession and looking at how it defines justification, I think that's been the greatest benefit of what we've done so far today. But let's continue. Here we go. And as the fruit of the Spirit is on display, that's a little a taste of kingdom living. Well, Matthew 5, 21 through 48 is often called the sixth, the sixth antithesis because all six sections begin with some variation of Christ saying, But I say to you, so just as a quick overview, what we're looking at in that section, uh, six sections, uh, six topics, Uh, the first one we're going to look at today, murder, anger, in uh, Matthew 5, 21 through 26, then adultery, Matthew 5, 27 through 30, Uh, divorce, Matthew 5, 31 through 32, oaths. Uh, Matthew 5, 33 through 37. Vengeance, Matthew 5, 38 through 42. And love for enemies, Matthew 5, 43 through 48. These things all relate to spirit-filled, if you will, kingdom living. Well, what was the point? Didn't Israel already know about murder, adultery, divorce, etc.? Well, yes, they did. But the deeper teaching of Christ shows that the law has an internal dimension. The law is not merely to be externalized, but also internalized. And that's where the power of the Holy Spirit comes in. Uh, Really, a a life uh, led by the Spirit is really a matter of supernatural living, supernatural empowerment to live such a life. It's not merely about our actions, but also about our thoughts that lead to actions. Things here once again, he's emphasizing supernatural power to live such a life. There's that whole you got the power to do it, you got the power to do it. That so dominates Christian teaching. On the way I was driving here this morning to church, and again, it was Christian radio. You got the power, you got the power. We, man, we we preach that like it, it never stops. But again, you've got the power to do it. You got the power to do it, but remember in previous sermons, you're not going to do it perfectly. However, you got to have a certain level of practical righteousness or you're not going to get into the kingdom. So now my my entrance into the kingdom of God is based off a of practical righteousness, which I possess, which goes literally against Protestant Reformation, like completely, this is infused righteousness. And then he, he even acknowledges this goes deeper than external. This goes beyond an external righteousness. You must, not only must you possess an external righteousness, you must possess an internal righteousness that is good enough, I guess, to get you into the kingdom of heaven. I am, I'm so trying to follow this that I, 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 this, this doesn't even, this ser- this ser- series of sermons, yes, they could be t- taken to our hermeneutics class. They need to be taken into a class on systematic theology when we get to the doctrine of justification. That's where this should go. And uh, and I and it would be interesting if I took some of these. Um, how does this uh, how does this relate to Colossians one eleven? All right, someone asked me how does this relate to Colossians one eleven. Let me go back here to 
Colossians 1.11. All right, that's okay. Colossians 1.11. Um, okay, yes, now this is a, this is a good passage. Uh, this is a good passage where in Colossians 1.11, it says, strengthened with all his might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Yes, this is another one of those passages that seems to speak of power. I'm, I've, this is what I'm, I've said it so many times. And, and uh, because I, I, there's no other way to get around this. So this is, what I'm go- this is what I will say. We have passages of scripture that at times seem to speak of some kind of power. How that power works, how that power operates, clearly I don't know, clearly I don't understand. But I do know this, clearly the power is not sufficient to make us, no one agree, no one argues that the power is sufficient to make us perfect. So there's a limit to this power, right? We're never gonna be perfect. We're still going to sin. So I just say, look, whatever power is there, God declares the power. I don't understand how it works. I just gotta live out my Christian life. And obviously anything I accomplish, God gets the credit for. Any godliness in my life, he gets the credit for. Any change in my life, he gets the credit for. It's not my power, his power, but I'm not going to sell it like, hey, I now have some power to keep the, the, the Ten Commandments or to keep anything because I know that I also have sin inside of me, which is going to constantly manifest itself. That's, that's the best I can do. Anything beyond that, I think gets us into trouble, gets us into trouble. Now, all right. So, So, but he just, again, in the sermon we just heard, he once again emphasizes the power, the power. So let's let's remind ourselves of what we have here. Let's go through this again. Based off all the sermons that we've reviewed so far and based off the one that we're currently listening to, here's where this is, if we were to give an outline, this is what he's established. Number one, the hermeneutic is this. Sermon on the Mount is a test to determine the genuineness of your repentance. All right, secondly, No one's going to do it perfectly. Third, yet you're given the power so that you can keep it perfectly. Four, your practical righteousness is the thing that gets you into the kingdom. Without practical righteousness, you don't get into the kingdom. So it's your practical righteousness that determines your entrance into the kingdom. Now you just put that all together. It's just, it's it's destroying literally this text having any meaning. Because everyone at that church should be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hell. You're going to hell. Yeah, you're going to hell. I'm going to hell. We're all going to hell. And, now, and he's also argued that, that, again, this practical righteousness has to go beyond external actions to an internal reality. It's really, really convoluted. And again, I hate to say this, they should change their name and, be, and become a Catholic church because this is straight up Catholic theology. It really is. This is based on, this is teaching an infused righteousness that I cooperate with. And I, if I cooperate with it enough and I have enough practical righteousness, I get into the kingdom of heaven. But if I read any ancient confession of faith dealing with the doctrine of justification, London Baptist, Westminster, read the first paragraph in any of those about justification, Justification, as taught by the reformers, is completely opposed to this. Now, I know this church may not be reformed, but they, they would definitely be Protestant, uh, but they're, they're more in line with the Catholic catechism at this point. It's really bizarre. All right, let's continue. Uh, the Jews kind of put the emphasis on just on external outward. You know, okay, you don't, I'm not a murderer. I haven't killed anybody. I mean, there's nobody laying in the street that I'm responsible for. Yeah, but what about your heart? What about your murderous heart that, that really would like to kill them, but you know you can't do it externally and get away with it? What about that? That's what Jesus is addressing. By the way, uh, this idea of living out kingdom ethics uh, coming from within by the power of the Holy Spirit is really new covenant stuff. It really is. The new covenant is all about the ministry of the Spirit The ministry of the Spirit changing people from the inside out. It relates inherently to our inward thoughts and disposition. Back in the Old Testament, and ultimately this is to be fulfilled in relationship to Israel and the kingdom. We as the church partake of it even now in terms of the spiritual aspects of the new covenant. But ultimately awaits fulfillment, complete fulfillment in the kingdom. But notice Jeremiah 31, 33 says... He's making a good distinction because the ultimate fulfillment will be Israel and the kingdom. I 
I agree with that because I don't think there's any way to to deal with this. But he's going to go to Jeremiah. Uh, man, Jeremiah. Here we go. The problems Jeremiah has caused me as a preacher. Right, Jeremiah chapter 31. I'll never forget preaching Jeremiah 31. And literally in the middle of the sermon, I realized that I have been teaching things that were wrong for years. There's nev- nothing more embarrassing than that. Literally, you're standing there, and, I'm, and I, I literally remember looking at stopping. I can, I can point to the point where I was standing in the church, and I stopped. I kind of reached up and kind of just started rubbing my hair, and I was like, uh, guys, I think, I think I've been wrong. I think I've been wrong. I, 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 I've been wrong. And that sparked a, what, year-long study of trying to figure out where we went wrong. And uh, here we go. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. I'm going to mute the mic for a second to take a drink. All right. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Here we go. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Please note the language. It is so specific. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Stop right there. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, uh, hang on. Um, <laughs> okay, so here we go. Here, here. It's, I'll, I'll explain everything in a minute. I, I was reading the comments that are coming in. Okay, here we go. And Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-one. Now, depending on your theological background, a lot of crazy things happen when you get to Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-one. If you're in the all millennial, very reformed camp, you will say Jeremiah thirty-one, that new covenant made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, that's spiritual Israel. That's spiritual. That's not literal Israel. That's not literal Israel in any way, shape, or form. That's spiritual Israel. That's the church. The new covenant is made with the church. And that's what we look for. We look for spiritual Israel. As soon as I read that, because what I was doing is I was giving a lesson on covenant theology. That's what I was giving a lesson on. And so I was going through how covenant theology believes there was a covenant of works in the garden. And then there was, they, they, they did not fulfill that covenant. So God established, established a covenant of grace and all of the other covenants in the Old Testament are simply administrations of the covenant of grace. And I was like, well, wait a minute. When, when we look at Jeremiah 31, verse 31 and 32, we, we, we discover something pretty interesting here. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Okay, it's new. That seems to be different. Remember, this is supposedly just an administration, uh, an administration of the one covenant of grace. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. Wait, this seems to be a separate covenant than that covenant. Well, wait a minute. Covenant theology says there was a covenant of works, they violated it, then God established the covenant of grace, and all the other covenants are just administrations of that one covenant of grace. But this seems like this is something new. This is something different. This is not like a covenant made with their fathers. So I was immediately starting to have a problem. And next it was saying, this is specifically made with the house of, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Well, what is fascinating is it speaks of both Israel and Judah. Both of them. Well, wait a minute. Israel went into Assyrian captivity, never really to come back out. Wait, wait, so wait a minute. Where? How can you make it with both of them? What, what, so I started going, wait, this doesn't make any sense. Because, so is this the church? So the house of Israel and the house of Judah is the church? Well, clearly no one at that time would have understood that. I mean, look, you know who he's speaking to, verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers and the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Clearly, that's the nation of Israel. Clearly, that's the Jews. That's not the church. That's not the church. So immediately, I was like, wait a minute. This is not working. So I b- clearly believe the new covenant, and I completely agree with the, the pastor we're listening to, and I, I appreciate that he's making this distinction. The ultimate fulfillment here is for Israel 
And, and the only place we can find this going to be fulfilled is you need a future millennial kingdom for this to work. Amillennialism says, no, this is to the church and, you know, basically in the millennial kingdom now. All right. So and we could get into a whole discussion. And I'm like, this just doesn't work. Now, I know my amillennial friends are going to say that I'm I'm not doing this fairly because we're not going into a full critique of amillennialism here. I understand that. And because amillennial, amillennialism, uh, covenant theology, um, same thing when it comes to infant baptism. What they, the, the argument always is, you don't understand because you haven't studied enough and you're just basically, you're not smart. That's the only thing they can ever come up with. You're not smart enough to get it. If you could really understand how to read, they can't really deal with some of these clear problems, right? House of Israel, House of Judah. So what we did at Victory Baptist Church is we spent six months, literally six months, every service was dedicated to everyone in this church holding a concordance. And we went through every use of the word Israel to see if we could find spiritual Israel. And over and over and over, Israel referred to Israel. Israel referred to Israel. And clearly in this context, to try to force spiritual Israel here is insane. Now, does the church participate somehow in the new covenant? Absolutely. But let's let's look at this, okay? But clearly this, this primary focus here is on Israel and Judah. So he's going to make a, a, a covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made of their fathers in that day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Please note, it's emphasizing it again so there can be no confusion. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the Lord for I will forgive their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Clearly that's for Israel. Clearly, that's for Israel. Clearly, God is going to do something for Israel in Israel to fulfill this ultimate promise. And and we have the only place we can put it is in the future, which would have to be in the millennial kingdom, where all Israel will be saved. This has how we how the church fits into this. There's great. And you go through church history, there's lots of disputes of what where where what what parts of this applies to the church and what part doesn't. What part does and what part doesn't? I know that in the church, here's this. I know that I participate in the forgiveness part. <laughs> I know, I know, praise God for that. I, 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 I participate in being, you know, engrafted in. I, I participate in being an adopted son of God. But you got to be very careful because some of this clearly has future millennial connotations, not the current situation in the church. Because clearly, we still uh, clear, we still have to continue to teach people. And then please note, I love verse 35. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day and an ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea uh, when the waves therefore roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, uh, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So you got to get rid of the the moon, the stars, and all of that, uh, because as long as they're there, this promise is going to stay intact. As long as that promise is there, as long as those things are there, those are proof that the promise is intact. And that promise is he's going to fulfill this for Israel. So your only hope is, does he fulfill this in coming out of Babylonian captivity? Doesn't seem to fit. Doesn't seem to fit. Especially in light of 70 AD, doesn't seem to fit. All right. So do you say that this was a promise for them coming out of Babylonian captivity? They failed. 70 AD was the destruction of, of Israel and then the church replaced it. You could make that argument or you could say, wait a minute. The coming out of Babylonian captivity does not fulfill these promises. It never was fulfilled the way these promises are put. So we have to look for a future fulfillment, which would be in the future kingdom. Now, what part of this can you apply to the church? You've got to be very careful what you start grabbing and throwing at the church. 
You got to be very careful because we, as the church, we don't look like the millennial kingdom. We don't look like that. So we got to be very careful what part we, we, we handle to it. All right. Wow, that, that we, we just went way deep into a lot of things there that's going to spark all kinds of controversy. I hate to see my email inbox tonight, but okay, all right. All the amillennialists are going to be so mad at me. I understand. Dispensationalists are going to be mad at me. I'm going to make everyone mad before this is over, all right? Hopefully that answered some of the questions, all right? We're at 55 minutes, so we're just going to listen to a we're going to, I'm going to try to let him get done with all of his introduction and get right to where he wants to start in Matthew 5, and then we'll stop right there. And I think we're very close to that, so let's do that. Here we go. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. He's talking about the new covenant. I will put my law, note the word law there, I will put my law in their minds, And write it on their hearts. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. If you are a Christian. You're saying this is where I live now. The spirit has done an amazing supernatural work of regeneration in my heart. And I'm now being processed. Where I am becoming more like Jesus. As the Holy Spirit works in my heart. It's an inside out dimension. Well, this is the. He immediately jumped to us. He immediately took Jeremiah. He even said that the future fulfillment is in the kingdom, but he immediately grabbed it and said, boom, pull that. That's to us. That's to us. Now, yes, there is a work of regeneration. I completely agree. Obviously, I believe that. I mean, my reformed theology teaches me that I, I could believe in the total deadness of the sinner. And then God brings me to spiritual life. Then I'm now alive to God. But at the same time, I don't believe that gives me some supernatural power that is going to allow me to fulfill the Sermon on the Mount because, because the reality says that I don't fulfill it. The reality is I've been regenerated, but guess what's still within me? A sinful nature that's going to continue to sin. Therefore, I have to look to something other than my own practical righteousness to determine if I'm saved. And that is the imputed righteousness given to me by Jesus Christ. See paragraph one of the London Baptist Confession of Faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and anything coming out of the Protestant Reformation. I do. I am not saved based off an infused righteousness that I cooperate with, and I have enough practical righteousness that supposedly proves that I'm saved. That is Catholicism. That's not Protestantism, all right? Okay, it's not, all right? And that's what he's already established. Again, that, that statement that I backed up and played earlier is just shocking. Hey, it's practical righteousness that determines if you get into the kingdom of heaven. No, it's imputed righteousness that determines if I get into the kingdom of heaven. Not, nothing on my, my behalf. Again, paragraph one, London Baptist, Westminster Confession. Everyone read it. Everyone write it down. Everyone put it on their refrigerator. Everyone get it tattooed on their back. I don't care what you do. Make sure you never forget that paragraph because it really summarizes, I believe, the biblical teaching on justification. That clearly Protestant churches abandon when preaching the Sermon on the Mount, okay? I, I don't know what happens. The aspect of the law that Jesus came to fulfill in a deeper sense in the lives of his people. In applying this internal aspect, Jesus came to fulfill this in the lives of his people. Jesus came to fulfill it in his life. And then that gets imputed to me. This is literally turning the Protestant Reformation upside down. I I, I really, when I'm listening to this, I feel like I'm sitting in the Catholic university. That's where I feel like I'm sitting. (laughs) He comes to fulfill it in him. Him, and then that's imputed to me. He doesn't come to fulfill it in me. He fulfills it for me, and that's imputed to me. (laughs) Because in me is no good thing. In me, I'm going to find the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. See Romans chapter 7. Respect to the law, Jesus presents this deeper understanding based upon his prophetic authority. All the way through the Sermon on the Mount... There is a special emphasis on the fact that Jesus taught with unique authority and not as the scribes. Think about this for me. I am emphasizing this. I did last week and I am this morning again. 
Who would have the audacity to come along after the Jews had the law for 1,500 years? That's pretty established, right? The law is a pretty established thing. 1,500 years we've been living by this code. Who has the audacity to come along after 15 years of this? Moses. gave God gave the law through Moses. You even have to stop right there. They spent 1,500 years failing to live by the law. They spent 1,500 years condemned by the law. They spent 1,500 years realizing that they were never going to fulfill it. They didn't live by it. They lived under it and was condemned by it. That, they didn't live according to the law. They violated it at every turn. The Old Testament is an entire story of Israel never fulfilling, obeying, or keeping the law. Never, ever, under any circumstances, because God's law can never be kept by sinful human beings. That's why we need a righteousness that comes from something other than what we do, but what someone else did on our behalf. That's the point. They didn't live by it. And I know he probably didn't mean it that way. But if you take everything he said, this is the, I mean, again, this is a situation where his hermeneutic has led him to violate his theology. The hermeneutic is leading to a complete violation of his theology. If we were to sit down, he would say, yes, I believe in justification by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. I'm, I'm assuming he would articulate the doctrine of forensic justification, imputed righteousness, as articulated in the Westminster and L London Baptist Confession of Faith. I'm sure he would do that. But his hermeneutic has led him to violate that very theology. That's, man. Your hermeneutic, okay, well, we could go all day here. I, I still, we're at an hour, and I, I don't like to go much further than this. I want him to get to at least where we have a good stopping point. So I'm going to play just a couple of more seconds here. Who has the audacity now to come along after 1,500 years and say, oh, by the way, let me tweak this a little bit for you. Let me enlighten you a little bit on the deeper reality of the law. Let me tell you that I have come to fulfill it in a deeper sense. Who in the world could possibly have this kind of authority? Well, only the Messiah, who is God in a human body, which is exactly who Jesus was. Moses was considered the greatest prophet in the history of Israel. At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, it says in Deuteronomy 34.10, quote, But since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses. Moses, the greatest prophet, said that God would in the future raise up another unique prophet who would speak the word of God with power and authority. Note this here in the book of Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, a great one, from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. So there's a unique, there's a unique person coming. He's going to be similar to me in, in the sense of uh, the greatest, and even greater ultimately. But Deuteronomy 18, 18, and 19 continues, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. So this coming prophet is really going to uniquely give uh, forth a uh, new revelation, authoritatively so, as Moses did. Well, the Jews rightly considered this prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 a messianic prophecy. Everybody understood that. In Acts 3, 22 and 23, Peter plainly said this was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, as the Messiah, ultimately fulfills perfectly the office of prophet, priest, and king. All in one person, which was unique. Uh, nobody ever fulfilled all three of these offices in the Old Testament. Maybe two of them, never three of them. But in Christ, all three are perfectly fulfilled. So Jesus... Uh, was a prophet, but he was more than a prophet. But he was certainly a prophet par excellent on a level higher than any other. You see, Jesus not only spoke for God, he was God. 
This is the level of authority seen in him as he explains and brings to fulfillment a deeper dimension of the law than anything ever realized before. Well, in this six-fold emphasis in Matthew uh, 5, I have to stop there because of time. I was trying to get when he got, I was trying to get to where he was going to get into the text. So let me try to summarize and get us where we are. And let's try to go through this because this is, woo, this has been a, this one, this one took a direction I was not prepared for. All right. So let's, let's do a couple of things here. First, first thing, let's, let's give praise where praise is due. He is doing a great job utilizing how Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount and how he's referencing Old Testament law and then adding a greater dimension. He's his, him, him pointing out that this is great proof of the deity of Jesus Christ and that this proof that Jesus is God is very well done. Great emphasis, an emphasis that even I may have missed. So nothing but great. I mean, that is awesome. That is awesome that the Sermon on the Mount could be utilized the way Jesus uses the Old Testament law and the, what he does with that law. The only person who could do that would be God himself. That is great. That is awesome. Another great argument for the deity of Jesus Christ to argue against the cults who would deny it. Great. That's awesome. Wonderful. However, sadly, there is some serious issues going on with the way he's handled this text. Let me walk through them one more time in summary. He has taught us that the Sermon on the Mount is the king, Jesus Christ, giving kingdom ethics. And the, and the way you get into the kingdom is repentance. How do you know if your repentance is genuine? Based off your obedience to the Sermon on the Mount. Yet he does nothing to try to articulate how this works, how we test this, how much obedience is sufficient to get into the kingdom, how much obedience is required to pass this test to determine if my repentance is genuine. Not only does he not articulate or explain how it works, he hasn't even emphasized that in each additional sermon. Because as I've already stated, I would have started each sermon going, okay, guys, this morning it's time for another test to determine how many people here have genuine repentance and how many people here are ungenuine repenters who are going to die and go to hell. But he has not emphasized that. Well, not emphasizing that is going against the very hermeneutic that he established in sermon number one, which then makes the entire Sermon on the Mount pointless if you're not driving that point home. If this is a test, drive it home. Test the people sitting there in Council Bluffs to see if anyone there is saved. I just know that as for me and my church, none of us would pass the test, so we would all go to hell. All right, and I'm already speaking for my people, even though they're not here. I'm just going to tell them they're going to hell. They're not going to pass the test. So, but he's not articulated what's required to pass the test, how much obedience, kind of obedience, 20%, 50, 70. He's not even driven that point home. He's also gone on to say that we have the power that Christ came to make, to make it possible that we keep it. Okay, so then that means if he's given us the power, then the test should be perfect obedience because God has given me the power to pass it, is required. But he's also gone on to say that no one's going to do it perfectly. So it's a test. It's a test. However, he can't tell me what's required for me to pass the test, but he's also he's clearly established that imperfection is sufficient enough to pass the test, just not how much imperfection is there. But he's also gone on to say that we've been given the power to keep it, but that no one's going to keep it perfectly. At this point, I'm already so confused, I don't even know what to do. And then he goes on to today in the sermon that we've been listening to today to literally blow my mind and to say that what Jesus is demanding, that if you're going to get into the kingdom, you have to have a practical righteousness. So my entrance into the kingdom is based off a practical righteousness I possess. Well, that is insanity because First of all, if I violate one point of the law, I'm guilty of all of the law. So that I would perpetually be in a state of complete disobedience to the law. So I don't know what level of practical righteousness would ever be sufficient to get me in. What level of practical righteousness? And to say that I get into the kingdom based off my practical righteousness is to take the doctrine of justification, flip the Protestant doctrine of justification, flip it back to Catholicism, which says that I'm infused with righteousness and then my my working with that practical righteousness, that infused righteousness, to a certain level could possibly get me to purgatory. 
Now, if I commit a mortal sin, I can lose the state of grace. But you, you realize you can, you got to work to get there. Well, if practical righteousness is the, t- the thing that determines my entrance into the kingdom, it's Catholicism. It's Catholicism. It destroys the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. And I know this pastor would say, no, I'm not doing that. That's what you've just done. You said that Christ came to say that with, and again, let me go back to the passage that he read and and, and read it the way he read it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. This is the way he read it. For I say unto you that except your righteousness, practical righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He read that to say that my practical righteousness must exceed the external righteousness of the scribes and Pharisee. So it's got to go beyond an external action to an internal action. And if it's not sufficient enough, I don't get into the kingdom. That is literally a false gospel. That is literally a destruction of everything the Protestant Reformation taught. It's a complete denial of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, and I believe of Scripture itself. And it becomes very close, becomes very close to doing this. It comes very close to doing this. And I'll just read it directly to you. All right? It becomes very close to doing this. Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from them that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have, which have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It's very close to a false gospel. I don't get into heaven because of a practical righteousness. I get into heaven because of a positional righteousness that was imputed unto my account. And I will end by picking up the Westminster Confession of Faith and reading to you one more time. Listen carefully. The Westminster Confession of Faith, it reads the exact same way in the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Those whom God effectually calleth He also freely justifieth, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, not by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ unto them, they receiving and resting on him and his righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves, it is the gift of God. In the Reformed position, even my faith is not mine. I don't believe because I chose to believe. I believe because God granted me faith. I did not not repent because I chose to repent. God had to grant me the repentance and grant me the faith because in a depraved heart, it will never produce faith or repentance. God had to give me both of those. So God grant, if you want to talk about power, he gives me the power to repent and the power to believe because I would never repent or believe on my own. But man, this... This is just frightening that he just read that Matthew 5 passage and turned that into practical righteousness. I have to have a practical righteousness that exceeds a certain level. And if it doesn't, I don't get into the kingdom of heaven. That's literally what he said. There's a level of practical righteousness you must possess or you don't get into heaven. Well, then forget what Jesus did. Forget it. Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross is irrelevant. My determine what will ultimately determines my salvation is the practical righteousness I have in my life. Then what did Jesus do? Jesus simply created a situation where I now have the ability to produce that practical righteousness. This is this is this may go beyond Pelagianism. Pelagius may have been happy with this sermon. No, no, no wonder Augustine was like, "What do you?" What are you doing, Pelagius? I mean, I mean, no, no wonder there was a, I should state it correctly, historically correctly. No wonder there was such a 
conflict between the Pelagius' doctrine and Augustine's doctrine. No wonder there was such a such a disagreement. No wonder we had the uh, the count the uh, the Synod of Dort. And we I mean, we could go through all the church. Church history has fought over this over and over and over again. Pelagius was basically, yeah, you you can do it. 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 And if you don't do it, well, then there's a problem. But you can. Jesus comes simply to make it possible for me to live, to develop enough practical righteousness in my life that will get me into heaven then Jesus didn't do anything. For, then why do I need his imputed righteousness? Either his imputed righteousness is sufficient or it's not sufficient. I mean, telling you what we just heard, even though it wasn't intentional, literally presented a false gospel, even though that wasn't the intention. By no means am I saying it's the intention. By no means am I saying this church holds in their doctrinal statement something different than what I've outlined. But the hermeneutic, by setting this up as a test, is what creates a interpretation that violates their very theology of justification, which is sad. There we go. I'll stop right there. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. I know all the amillennialists are already ready to go after me. Dispensationalists are ready to go after me. Uh, Lordship salvation people are ready to go after me. Free grace people are ready to go after me. I pretty much have ticked off every branch of Christianity in this one episode. So I will be sending all, all of my emails to my friends in Nebraska. You created this problem. It's yours because you told me about this and then I start reviewing this and then I get myself in trouble. So they're going to be answering all of my emails because it's, it's just, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Everyone have a great day. I, I think I'll be back on the air shortly for at least one more live broadcast before I head home uh, because I'm losing my voice. All right, everyone have a great day. God bless.